many uh, places around the world, you would have just put yourself, your family, your stuff at great risk for gathering together to sing such a thing. Right? We're going to be studying again in the book of Acts, so if you have a Bible with you, I hope you do, uh, go ahead and turn with me to chapter 6. And as you're doing that, I want to share with you a statement I think is important, and that is this, the world has never martyred a casual Christian. The world has never martyred a casual Christian. And as we're going to see today, like the first martyr, Stephen, the persecuted church today stands tall for the sake of the call of Christ Jesus. And friends, God still calls everyday people, just like Stephen, to do extraordinary things. Sometimes it means standing up to ridicule, abuse, or even persecution. Sometimes it means standing tall, perhaps alone, in the face of scoffers. But friends, if we as Christ's followers today don't have some difficulty with the world around us, then something is wrong. Something is wrong. Before we turn and study in the book of Acts, I want to share some scripture with you this morning from a fairly a variety of verses just to give you a perspective of what the Bible has to say about this. Why? Because we live in a simple and easy time to be a Christian. And it's possible, in fact probable, that we will begin to assume that what we have enjoyed as our Christian experience in the Western world is and should be the norm. But it hasn't been. And it isn't in many places today. Listen to Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on, a, on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. John writes, I have said all these things, he's speaking, quoting Jesus, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. In Luke, we hear this, then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places, famines and pestilences, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives." Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy, indeed all those who desire to live godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Peter writes, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
We hear this in Romans, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your, your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The psalmist writes, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That is just a small selection of scripture regarding this subject. Brothers and sisters, the word of God says the world holds no love for you. And we as Christ's followers should not have any love for it either. I'm not talking about the people in the world. We're commanded to love people. But I'm talking about this world system run by Satan that sets the values and drives the course of, a, of the global ep- economic, political, social world that we live in. And tragically, many hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions and millions of people who were believers down through the centuries, have given their lives for their faith in Christ from that day that the church began that we just studied in Acts chapter 2. But I think even more tragic is the fact that this day, today, when persecution is at an all-time high across the globe, Christians in our Western world are seeking and find comfort in the very same satanic world system that persecutes, tortures, murders believers every day. And I think it's time that we face this very clear fact. We cannot love the world and Jesus too. Listen to 1 John. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Our Lord said it very clearly, we cannot serve two men. today, you might, as we go through it, be tempted to shrink away from its challenging personal implications for what it might have to say about your faith. Some of you, some of us this morning, will be frankly squirming in our seat or on the pulpit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will be at work as he always is, making direct application of God's word to our hearts. Let me tell you, if that's you today, I want to encourage you, already in advance, let him do whatever work he wishes. Let him reach into your heart. Let him challenge your very values, your beliefs, your faith. Let him, if necessary, reorganize any and every part of your life, if necessary. I am sad to say there will be some here this morning that will be completely unaffected. Nothing we read or discuss here will break through a very hard heart. You'll have come, put in your time, gone through the motions, and believe that your religious duty is done. And you'll depart unmoved, untouched, unchallenged unchanged. Why? Because we live in a world where Christianity is a convenience. Few of us here have ever experienced any real type of persecution for our faith. But yet today, thousands, this very day, who stand for Jesus risk financial ruin, family betrayal, Prison, beatings, rape, and martyrdom. Do you understand that? 
We can be thankful that we live in a country where we still have the freedom to gather like we are today and worship our God without fear. But things are changing. It's getting harder to speak for Christ in the public square. Recent attack on our uh, vice president's faith would give some indication of that. The temperature is going up. And the frog senses something's changing, but will we jump out or will we boil? Time will tell. You have your Bibles? Turn with me to Acts chapter 6, and we're going to begin reading in verse 8. We'll stop in verse 15, but we're going to read, let me just warn you, we're going to read all the way through the end of the book of chapter 7. Yeah, we've got a ways to go. Let's take a look at the first few verses here, chapter 6, verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrians and of the Alexandrians and those from Cilicia and Asia rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly instigated men who said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And they set up false witness who said, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. We want to look beginning here now, first of all, at Stephen's arrest and notice his character, if you will. We know for a fact, just what we looked at last week, Stephen was one of the seven Hellenist Jews, those Greek-speaking Jews that were selected to serve the needs of the Hellenist or Greek-speaking widows, do you recall? And one of the characteristics that Peter set down for them, one of the qualifications, was that they would be full of the spirit and wisdom. You find that chapter 6, verse 3. So we know he had the spirit and wisdom. Here in this text, we see also in chapter 6, verse 5, that he was full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 8, that he was full of God's grace and power. Stephen was in that sense a model believer but he was also an ordinary person. This was not one of the apostles that had walked with Jesus. This was not one of the, he was one of the early disciples that, that was, became a believer based on their testimony. But God uses ordinary people who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom and grace and his power, and he uses them to accomplish his purpose and advance his kingdom, as we will see. We learn from these verses that Stephen did obviously more than just serve the, hell the widow's needs. God did miraculous things through Stephen. It says he did signs and wonders. And as you recall from our earlier study in the book of Acts, whenever those signs and wonders came, they were there to attest to the authenticity of the gospel message, to put God's stamp of approval on that gospel. Stephen is the first person other than Jesus and the apostles of whom the New Testament describes as doing miracles. Now, last week we saw how some of the priests who were of the Hellenistic Jews, you recall those were the Greek-speaking Jews. The people who were in Jerusalem spoke Aramaic. So these were people who had probably been in the dispersion, who had been un, come out of that and carried on their Greek uh, ways. Some of those priests in the smaller outlying areas who weren't affected so much by the temple worship became believers. We know that many other Greek-speaking Jews became believers. We know that from the fact that there were many women uh, uh, widows who were in need in the church, right? Perhaps their conversion and this large number of people leaving, uh, uh, turning away from the teaching of the religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and the scribes and the Sanhedrin, perhaps this is what prompted the debate that we will see coming here. Perhaps it was their loss of control and power over people. But whatever the cause, a debate arises, and Stephen 
is in the thick of it. I want you to listen to what Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 15. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him, him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Stephen, God used Stephen to do miracles, just like God did miracles through Jesus and the other apostles. But even when those things authenticated the message, people still resisted. And what we see here in verse 9 and following is an external opposition, opposition from outside the church. At the day of Pentecost, the Father did prom what he promised, what Jesus promised here. He sent the Holy Spirit of truth. And from that moment on, the apostles and the disciples, including Stephen, were out in the public bearing bold testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, this irritated the Jews, especially the Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection. And here we see that it irritated some Greek-speaking Jews who stood up and opposed Stephen's testimony. Let's learn a little bit about them. These Jews were from, first of all, Cyrene. That's a Greek colony on the coast of Libya in Africa. Also from Alexandria, if you've studied any history, you remember that was the great commercial metropolis founded by Alexander the Great. In their mind, had worked so successfully with Jesus. They charged Stephen with blasphemy and arrested him. That's what we have seen so far. Just like the arrest and trial of Jesus, the religious leaders here, what did they do? They stirred up the people against him. And then it says they secretly instigated false witness about him. In other words, they coached people how to lie in testimony. Friends, I want to take just a moment here and talk to you about the human heart, the will. God made man and woman to have dominion, one of the things we see early in the book of Genesis. But that dominion was supposed to be subjected to his will. And when Adam sinned, it was basically saying, I will have my own way. Influenced by Satan who said what? I will have my own way. I will be like a god. And from that moment on, every single man, woman, boy, and girl ever born on this planet has a fallen human will. And we were given the responsibility of dominion to rule and reign in this creation, and as we see in the Bible, actually beyond this world into the next. But friends, that kingdom, that kingdom that is yours, that extended reign of your will is not to subject somebody else into it. It's to be subjected under God's. And so what we see, especially in religion, because we're dealing with ideology, is that people who have a deep desire to exert their will over others use religion to do so. Or they use politics to do so. Or they use economics to do so. 
And in this case, you have seen from the moment you read the story of Jesus how the religious leaders wanted to exert power and control and influence and extend the range of their will over on other people. The same thing continues to happen today. Friends, you don't have the right to exert your will or extend the reach of your kingdom beyond what God allows. But he desires, as you align your kingdom to his, that we expand his kingdom. His kingdom come, not my kingdom come. That's what's going on here behind the scenes. Now let's take a look at the charges against Stephen. They said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses. That's, that's the law, the Old Testament legal system which governed the social and religious life of the Jews. And also against God, verse 11. Then it says, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place, the temple. That again is regarding the religious system. By the way, be careful when somebody you're talking to says, well, they never do this or they always do that. You can already tell they're sort of expanding the truth. My wife always accuses me of that. (laughs) Every once in a while she says I speak evangelistically. Okay, let's get back on track here. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Now, by the way, he might have said a little bit of something like that. Didn't Jesus say to them, while they're standing there in the temple, there won't be any stones standing one on the other? It wasn't Jesus saying he was going to destroy it, but it would be destroyed. Who was the one that destroyed it? The Romans. Not too many days forward from this conversation. So the Greek-speaking Jews here, just like their Aramaic-speaking brothers who worshipped their traditions and believed in their own ability to carry out the letter of the law, they believed that that their human effort would somehow or another make them righteous before God. That was the trouble with the religious system of the Jews at the time that Christ came. We understand from Paul's writing in the book of Romans that the law was designed to what? Point us towards our need for God's grace. Why? Because we couldn't keep it. Not only did they feel that they could keep it and be self-righteous, the the Pharisees and the other religious leaders added, what, 600 more laws on top of the Ten Commandments. And they would pat themselves on the back at their ability to keep them. Of course, they didn't understand the spirit of the law. Have you murdered anybody lately? No, I haven't murdered anybody. How, How about hating your neighbor? Well... And like Jesus, Stephen had shown them that their self-righteousness was woefully inadequate and that they needed God's grace and that God in His grace had sent them a Savior. Who? Jesus Christ. They were sinners in need of grace, not saints to whom God owed something. And so they arrested him and they brought him before the council that's the sanhedrin the religious the council of the religious leaders the same hypocrites by the way who opposed Jesus and they ruled over the social and religious life of the Jewish people these were people that Jesus said loved to have the preeminence that their position provided they were power hungry deeply unrighteous and desperate This is the third time so far in the book of Acts that they've been mentioned. The first time we see them warning Peter and John, don't go and say anything about Jesus. You remember? And what did they say? Hey, we're going to say whatever we want. That's not exactly how they said it, but God told us to give testimony to Jesus and we're going to do so is basically what they said. And then in chapter 5, they actually flogged, publicly beat the apostles, and now here we see they went even a step further further and murdered Stephen. You see, these people had lost a lot of followers. Their ploy to destroy Jesus had backfired significantly. They'd lost face to Peter when he comes in and heals the man, and the whole of the people around it know that God's at work there, and people are listening to Peter and the words he's speaking about the grace of God. 
And they all saw, it makes it very clear here, they all saw God's hand in the life of Peter. It was something they couldn't ignore. They saw that his face was like that of an angel. I think Luke adds this verse here to make it the important point that the council, what they choose to do next, they did in spite of a clear knowledge that God was with Stephen. Yet they willfully opposed his message just like they opposed Jesus himself. I think what they're saying is this. Stephen glowed. How many of you have been in Europe to some of the great, uh, let's say, museums or some of the great cathedrals there, and you see the pictures, and they always have the saint with the halo thing? That's kind of what I think this is talking about. And I know you might think, well, that's just, you know, medieval artists, but I will tell you, when I was a little boy, I would sit here somewhere in the front, usually in the front because I would get in trouble in church, so my dad could kind of point at me. If I was worse, it was back there. That was much worse. (coughs) But I remember one day looking, and he was preaching very powerfully, and he just glowed completely. And it was the aura of God, the power of God, the Holy Spirit speaking through him, right? I think that's what this is describing, something like that. They knew God was with him. Now, what happens here in this section that we're dealing with, this great passage, we're going to look at the rest of chapter 7 here, is that it marks a transition point in Luke's presentation here of the history of the church, Luke's record. In the story of Stephen and what follows, we see the climax of the witness or the testimony of the church in Jerusalem because the persecution, the martyrdom of Stephen and the persecution that follows now sends the church out. And the rest of it, we see, picks up the story of the gospel taken to Samaria and the other most parts of the earth, which is exactly what Jesus had said would happen. You will be witnesses to me where? In Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so we see this beginning. Now, notice next, Stephen, as we know, Stephen is arrested. He's brought before the council, and he is placed before the high priest who says to him, are these things so? Speaking of the various charges against him of blasphemy. And what follows is Stephen's defense, and this speech is prompted by this question from the high priest. Stephen's defense answers, as we're going to see here, and we won't have time to pull every piece apart because guess what? We still got 60 verses to go. Okay, about lunch. <clears throat> Are you ready? What we're going to see is Stephen's defense answers the accusations, but he also comes back with an accusation of his own at the end of it. But it gives us a lot of the insight of his extensive knowledge and appreciation of Jewish history, his perspective on the disobedience of the Jews, and also how they opposed God. All right, a little bit before we get started here, some highlights about Stephen's defense. Stephen reaches back to the very foundation of the Jewish nation. So follow along with me, and I'll sort of uh, comment as we go. Is that okay? Chapter 7, verse 1. And the high priest said, Are these things so? And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran, and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred, and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others, who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. 
Now what we see here is he reaches back, Stephen reaches back to the foundation of the nation, and that foundation of the nation goes back to Abraham, one of the patriarchs of the Jewish people. And specifically, he focuses on the what we call the Abrahamic covenant that you see uh, in Genesis chapter 12. When you are studying the book of Genesis, Genesis 12 is about as big as it gets. Actually, it lays the foundation for just about the rest of the Bible. And it records God's unconditional promises to this nation that would come from Abraham. I'm going to give you a little summary of that, that covenant. First of all, the promise of God to Abraham was about people and land. First, we see it's about posterity. Posterity is people. You will be the father of many nations, God promised him. It's about a specific land, though Abraham didn't enjoy the benefit of, of living there. And yes, that nation eventually ended up down in Egypt, as, as, as we saw here that, that uh, Stephen had talked about for 400 years. Still, there was a specific land identified. And today, friends, that still continues to be debated, doesn't it? All these thousands of years later, there is nothing going on in the world that really is as important as what is going on in the epicenter in Israel. God promised to, na to Abraham that he would have a great name, that he would have a huge nation that would be so numerous that you, it would be like the sands of the, of the sea and the stars in the sky. Secondly, this promise of God was about righteousness that would be, a, a be Abraham's, but a righteousness that would come through faith. And Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. God would be for him and for the people that came from him. And God would forgive their sins and treat them with mercy and grace. And then thirdly, this, this covenant was about blessings to all the family of the earth. Through you will all the nations of the earth be blessed. What is that referring to? Of course, the coming Messiah, Jesus. The redeemer of all that was lost would come through Abraham. Now notice in verse 8, he also then ties that to Isaac and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the patriarchs of the Jewish people. Still today, when they talk about the patriarchs or our fathers, they're talking about Jehovah God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The nation were heirs of the promise. These two gentlemen were specifically heirs as well. Isaac, not Ishmael. Jacob, not Esau. And so the promises that God made to, to Abraham, he reiterated to Isaac in Genesis 26, to Jacob in Genesis 27. Now, from verse 9 and following, follow along, and let's read again in verse 9 through verse 19. Hang in there, guys. We're going to make it. You're doubtful. <clears throat> Where's your faith? The patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of all afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over his household. Now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to the brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. That was the extent of the nation at that point as it moves into Egypt. Of course, you know it comes out several million later. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, and he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in a tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. All of this you can read in the Old Testament, friends. But as the time of promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose in Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. And he dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants to basically be killed so that they would not be kept alive. At th that's where we want to stop there. So he goes on and he then continues the story of the nation from Joseph to Moses. It's the story of Israel in its captivity in Egypt. It's the story of how it grows and how God protects them there and how he prepares them to then leave Egypt and receive that promised land that God had made for Abraham. Let's pick up in verse 20. At this time, Moses was born and he was beautiful in God's sight. 
And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, in other words, when Pharaoh daughter, uh, said, let's kill the kids. You remember the story. Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And he was mighty in words and deeds. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers and the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, when he was 40 years old, uh, when he, excuse me, now when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in the bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and as he drew to near to look, there came the voice of the Lord, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Moses trembled. And did not dare look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send you to Egypt. Why is this being recorded in Stephen's testimony? To show that he had not demeaned in any way the history of the Jews. Here we get the story from Moses to the Exodus. Moses is the central figure in a central figure in Jewish history. This is the one who wrote the first five books of the Bible. He is also a man that God used to deliver the nation from its slavery in Egypt. And so we get the story of Moses, and the story of Moses is the story of three forties. First 40 years in Egypt, growing up in the Pharaoh's house, then the next 40 years on the backside of the desert, and then 40 years wandering around with disobedient and complaining Jews. Not a lot of fun. Notice in verse you will here, there's a special emphasis, though, that takes place in verses 35 through 37, and it's a shift away from just the nice story about Israel. It tells us that Moses was sent by God as ruler, and the word literally is redeemer. Now, I want you to understand that here, as it's related to us in the book of Acts, that word Luke only uses of Christ only uses of Christ. We notice in verse uh, 36 that he performs signs and wonders, proving that God was with Moses. In verse 37, that he prophesied specifically about Jesus. And right here, Stephen is interjecting about Jesus, though he doesn't use his name. He says, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Do you see it? God will raise up for me a prophet. From, uh, for you, a prophet like me from your brothers. Stephen is referring specifically to Jesus at this point. Now, I want you to connect Moses and Jesus for a minute. Moses is a foreshadow, a type, a picture of Jesus. They were both prophets. They were both deliverers of Israel. They were both denied and rejected by the Jewish people. They both performed signs and wonders, just like Stephen had done. They both reflected the glory of God. Do you remember Moses when he went up to get the, the Ten Commandments and he came down shining? And Jesus, of course, when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They were both ministered to by angels. But what's the major difference? Moses brought the law to the people. Jesus fulfilled the law, bringing grace and truth. Jesus is greater, and that's what the Sanhedrin hated. They wanted the traditions of Moses, but not the truth about Jesus. Notice, if you will, verse 38, a very important verse here. Now, let's go to 35. Then Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of angel who appeared to him out in the bush. This man led them out of performing signs and wonders in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said... 
to the Israelites, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give to us, but our fathers refused to obey him. And they thrust him aside, and in their hearts they turned, it says, to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to the worship of the host of heaven. What do we see happening here? A couple of things. First of all, not only the Abrahamic covenant, which is significant in the history of the nation, but also the Mosaic covenant. And the Mosaic covenant is the law. You remember the Ten Commandments. And what it basically said was this, if you keep these, you will be able to stay in possession of the land. If you don't, you won't. Moses on Mount Sinai received a conditional covenant from God for the nation. And they promised, God promised that I will be with you and you'll possess that land if you're obedient. Of course, they weren't. What is the point here? Stephen isn't the one blaspheming against the law. They didn't keep it. They twisted it to their purposes. They disobeyed it. And so in the latter portion of that verses we just read, we see Israel's apostasy and their disobedience. They refused, it says, the oracles of God, his laws. They abandoned Moses and so doing abandoned God. They turned over their hearts to the idols of Egypt. They forced Aaron to make them a golden calf, you recall, and they sacrificed to an idol of their own creation. What is the result? It says God turned away from them and gave them over to the worship of the creation, not the creator. Sound familiar? Remember Romans chapter 1? And now it talks about specifically, notice in verse 42 and following, did you bring to me slain beasts and and sacrifices during the 40 years of the wilderness of O Israel, house of Israel? No, you took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your God Rapha, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile into Babylon. What did they do? They refused to obey, and they actually turned towards something that the Old Testament describes as so heinous, so horrible, The great apostasy of the Jews reached its height when they turned, it says, and offered their children to the god Moloch, making them go through the fire. The god Moloch was a a god of the Ammonites, and it was often formed in 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 a big idol with its arms like this, and the belly was open where there would be a fire there, and they would put infant children that would roll down the arms into the fire. This pagan deity... They offered human sacrifices to, infant sacrifices to. Even Solomon, who wanted to please his pagan wives, built a high place to Moloch near the Mount of Olives. It's called the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna. And literally in the New Testament is associated with a place so horrible it's like hell. The Jews turned away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They turned to pagan idols and their idolatry brought God's judgment on them all as it was promised in the Mosaic Covenant. And they were defeated, and they were taken into captivity. Notice in verses 44 through 47. By the way, why is that important? Because, again, Stephen isn't saying, I'm I'm guilty of this blasphemy. He's turning it around and saying, you're the ones who blasphemed and disobeyed God. Now look at verse 44 and following. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it. According to the pattern that he had seen, our fathers in turn brought it uh, in with Joshua when they disposed the nation, dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God, and we asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob, but that it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High God does not dwell in houses made by hands. There's another sort of a Important point here, he's proving to them he did not dishonor the temple as they were saying. He's going back and talking about the tabernacle. That was the predecessor to the temple. It was the tent that moved before the nation of Israel. It was the place where God dwelt. 
And he's reminding them that the Jews in their own disobedience had turned away from the worship that God had given to them. Joshua, he talks about, had the tabernacle, and David had a desire to build the temple. Solomon, of course, God used to build the temple. But I want you to see a focus here in just the next couple of verses, verses 48 and following. The Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, and what is this place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? What is Stephen saying here? He's directly linking the Old Testament Jews with the very hearts of the Sanhedrin. Just like their forefathers, they disobeyed God's law and they sought their own self-righteousness. They resisted the Holy Spirit, preferring their own evil wills. They rejected God's messengers. They killed the prophets, including, it tells us a little bit later, the righteous one. What he's focusing on is this. God is not limited to this temple. God is what? Spirit. And must be worshipped in spirit and truth, not in ritual and traditions of men. Stephen didn't blaspheme against the holy place. They were the ones who were profaning it. And then as we get close to the end here, we see that Stephen literally turns and accuses them directly. Follow verse 51. You notice he went from brothers and fathers. Listen to what he says next. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets do your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. They possessed the law in their hands, but not their hearts. In their own apostasy, they led the people astray, away from worshiping God. Their guilt was clear, their judgment sure. This sounds exactly like what Peter spoke in chapter 2, you recall? You killed the righteous one that God sent, the Messiah. And Stephen, just like Peter, lays the guilt for the crucifixion of Jesus at the hands of these religious leaders. But unlike Peter, Stephen never gets an opportunity to offer them an opportunity to repent. Why? Look at the next verse. When they heard these things, they were enraged, and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus, standing at the right hand of God, said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, Stephen called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he died. And so we see Stephen's murder here. Stephen, who had faith in Christ, makes it clear in these verses that Jesus Christ is both God and man that He is the Lord of the universe, that He is Savior of the world. The phrase here, the Son of Man, was Jesus' favorite title for Himself. But Stephen recalls the words that Jesus spoke when He Himself was standing before this same council. Listen to what Luke 22 says. This is Jesus it's talking about. When the day came, the assembly of the elders and the people gathered together, both the chief priests and the scribes, and they led him away to the council. That's Jesus. And they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, get this, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they said, are you the Son of God? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, well, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it from our own lips. And as you know, they went about to kill Jesus. From now on, the Son of God will be where? At the right hand of God. 
what did Stephen see? The Son of God at the right hand of the Father. Stephen presented Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah, the sacrificial Savior, the gracious Redeemer, the glorious King, both God and man, and Lord of all creation. And they hardened their hearts against him. And friends, right here this morning, people still do the same thing. The religious leaders of Jesus, uh, Jesus and Stephen's day rejected all evidence of Christ's divinity. They rejected his claims, and then they proudly rejected his message. What's the application? You are not responsible for the way people respond to the gospel. You are responsible for a clear presentation of it. When people come face to face with the gospel, the powerful Holy Spirit convicts them of its truth and their own sinfulness. And when that happens, some respond in repentance and others respond in outright rebellion. Some feel threatened, and of those, some carry out the most horrible kinds of persecutions on the messengers of the kingdom of God. But when it comes to the gospel, we must not seek the path of least resistance. Paul says what? I am not ashamed. Are we? We dare not desire a truce with this age. When the early church wore scars for its testimony, why are we wearing medals? You see, the gospel thrives on persecution. It makes better headway against a world that fights against it than a world that trifles with it and plays with it. It is better to have bitter hostility than half-hearted endorsement. Friends, 2000. And 17 was the worst year for the persecution of believers in the last 25. For the 14th year in a row, North Korea is now the worst place to be a Christian. Islamic, I don't know what you call it, fervor is the greatest cost of human, Christian human life but so is ethnic nationality now happening. But I want to say this, if we are having trouble standing up for Jesus in the face of whatever slight ridicule you might face here on Maui, or whatever slight rejection you might actually possibly face, then how will we fare when the pressure is really on? Persecution is coming to this Western world. When it comes, will be will we will we be able to stand for the sake of the call? The psalmist says this precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. I'm a few minutes over, is that okay? Good, then you give me a couple more minutes. <clears throat> We're gonna finish with a song playing. And all I want you to do is this right where you're at, with a few people around you. We're going to pray. Just turn around as best you can, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for two things, friends. Number one, for all those brothers and sisters in Christ around our world today who are facing real persecution. They risk everything for the testimony of Christ. And we are going to pray for the kind of resolve that we might have when the time comes for us to stand for Christ. Will you do that with me? There'll be a song playing in the background, a song called For the Sake of the Call, written by Stephen Curtis Chapman many years ago. You might find it interesting. Turn around, let's pray together. <clears throat>